All right, BradCooney.com. I'd like to welcome in to the show from the legendary rock band Sticks, and of course, Gowan. Mr. Lawrence Gowan, thank you so much for joining us, sir. Pleasure, Brad. How are you today? I'm doing great, man. First and foremost, thank you so much for doing this, man. We're just honored to have you know you and um, what you represent for music and, and in such a great band with Sticks on the show. It's just, it's a real honor. Oh, great. All right, so let's talk about this. Um, you guys released your, your latest record, The Mission. I've listened to every song on, on it. It's, it's, it's great. It's just, it's just a refreshing. Um, it's just refreshing to hear great music. Not that it's not good music now, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm like probably, I don't know how old, you are, how old you are, but I'm over 50 years old. So you know I'm a Styx guy, an ELO guy, a Yes guy, a That Error guy. So that's what I yeah. hear. I hear all that mixed up in a bottle. Plus, of course, sticks, you know. So talk about this record, yeah. 14 new tracks. Sure. Uh, the, the Mission is uh, a record that we intentionally uh, set out to make it to sound as much like everything that you just described. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, to a T. I mean, that's exactly what, what, what we... What our starting point was, was we, we got, come to a point where we realized that if we're going to do a new record, it has to resonate with the past. It has to somehow sound as if it could easily slot in with, uh, alongside any one of the big, the big four, we call them, the big four six records, the, the four triple platinums that they had in a row of Grand Illusion, Pieces of Eight, Paradise Theater, and Cornerstone. And so, uh, we intentionally, you know, wrote the songs in such a way and, and arranged them in such a way that uh, that they would that they would, you know, fit in, so to speak, and they wouldn't sound like we were embracing anything really of the modern digital age, but instead pretend like it's 1979 and let's let's do everything as if we're living in that era and soak up uh, all of those influences and all of those uh, factors that, that that you outlined. Um, and make sure that they find their way onto the record. So, as a result, we, we wound up recording the album actually three times. Oh, wow. It was the, the songwriting demo stage, we'll call it that, uh, and that took place at uh, Tommy's Place in Nashville. Uh, then, uh, and that was that was mainly uh, Tommy, myself, and our uh, producer, Willie Dankovich. But then when we brought the rest of the guys in, to flush, finish out the, the, the writing and, and just basically to get their input as to where the record was at that point. Uh, we recorded everything again, you know, uh, again in a, in a home studio environment in Tommy's home studio. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a full elaborate studio, oh, sure. but uh, <laughs> we, we, we still were recording as if it was, uh, you know, 20, what year was it, 2016. And, but then once we, once we knew what exactly where all the pieces of the of the puzzle would fit together? We then completely went full on. Uh, I call it full on 1979. We went into a studio called Blackbird in Nashville, and we recorded everything to, to two inch tape. And we didn't use any digital plugins or anything like that at all. It was all wow. Uh, as I, we used all the old gear. Luckily, that studio that where all the old gear is is, is in. <laughs> the greatest condition it could possibly be. So we went to great lengths, you know, to shut off our cell phones <laughs> and basically go back to that technology and allow it to find its way to seep into every aspect of the mission. And that's why the record sounds like it does, particularly if you're listening to it uh, on a great big fat vinyl record. Mm. You know, it's almost like I want to go dig out my old 8-track player. Maybe you guys can make an 8-track of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that. We um, JY makes a point of uh, you know last year was the the 40th anniversary of Grand Illusion and, and Grand Illusion sold six million copies and JY always mentions in the show that one million of those records so to speak were um, eight, eight track tapes. Wow. And yeah, that that's a format that who knows? I mean, I, <laughs> yeah. you never. You, I would I would never second guess it. You know, I wouldn't second guess 78 RPM records at this point. So, uh, anyway, there, there you have it. You know, I really miss that error. I miss, you know, like it's as simple as like buying a record. I miss like 
one of the, one of the things I use I used to love about buying the old records from you know of course I bought Styx, Styx records too was like the yeah. whole packaging of it you'd open up the album yeah. you it's like a it's like it's like Christmas time you don't know what's inside the bands would sometimes include the lyrics and they had stickers or posters um, just the smell of the well, record you know I, that I miss that absolutely no and, and we I entirely relate. In every way to what you're saying, yeah. that's called a tactile experience, where <laughs> you, your 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 senses, particularly your senses of touch and and vision and sight, and even I'd even bring it down. Well, vision and sight, I think, would do the same thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the the oral experience, you know, of listening to it, but also the the. Um, the artwork and how you're interpreting that, right. but also it, it, it focused you. You suddenly were in this focused uh, place where you're trying to divulge everything you can about this record, and you're, you're simultaneously trying to decide, you know, where on the scale of one to ten are you enjoying it? Uh, you know, how much more do you have to listen to it before you get the vibe of what it is? And it's it's funny that it's it's younger people that that really uh, uh, were, the, were the spark for this resurgence in that experience because I guess they, they discovered it along the way. At first it started as a bunch of hipsters maybe 10 years ago or so that, uh, that they got into the idea of it. Mm. But, but there were, and now it's to the point where, you know, I mean, I, I know that the last year in, in England for one month, digi uh, digital sales were outpaced by the sales of vinyl. And oh, wow. we see that our shows, well, we see we see half the audience is under 30 years of age. Yeah, I was going to ask you that, Lars. I was going to ask you. At any given stick, stick show, yeah. I was going to ask and you that. They, yeah, they, they love that experience of the, of the album. In fact, I, we haven't done a test yet to see, but uh, I would be willing to bet that of the vinyl records that have sold, I would I would imagine that probably the majority of them have gone to people that are under thirty. Wow! Uh, I just have a I, just just a sense I have about that. Nothing I can back it up with yet. Sure. Yeah. I haven't put the study in, in play, but I, I see more younger people holding up copies of the record at the show wow. than uh, than anyone. That's great news. I was going to ask you about the age, like the age brackets you see at your shows i went to a, a to a brett michaels concert a couple of years ago the singer from poison of course and i was yeah. standing there and i'm looking across the crowd and i see i see everything from like 18 year olds to 55 and 60 year olds you know yeah. it, it was it, but it was great i'm like oh man music's still you know it's just handing off the torch to each generation yeah exactly well at our shows you'll see people from you know, obviously, if someone brings their kids, it's sure. it, it's ten year olds, to, ten year olds to seventy year olds, That's with great. the bulk of the audience being probably somewhere between, I would say, twenty five. And fifty-five. I would say that's the that's the big bubble in the middle, you know. Yeah. And uh, and of those, I would say about half the people on any given night, about half of them are at least under thirty. Wow. So that means that means they weren't even born when the biggest six records are made. They they, they have come to the classic rock era of music uh, they, uh, by whatever path, you know. They've they've made it there. And once they see a, 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 a rock show on the level that we're able to um, oh, yeah. deliver at night, they, they become they become diehard fans as if this becomes part of their era. Mm -hmm. You know, they've discovered this great thing, and and they're not going to let go of it. Yeah, it's a great point, man. <laughs> so you guys, um, you guys will hit the road at the end of May. I mean, I, I, I know you just mentioned you're you, you're getting ready to do a, a show there in South Carolina, but I read that you yeah. guys have this have this tour coming up with Joan Jett and Tesla at the end of May. Yeah. Can you talk about that. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we're just right now in the final. Uh, I think we have about ten shows to go with uh, uh, us and Ario Speedwagon and Don Felder of the Eagles. Mm -hmm. that, that's going extremely well. Okay. <laughs> but. Uh, but we are. We do have our sights set on the, the, the fact that the big blockbuster tour for us this summer is us and Joan Jett and our, our friends Tesla are coming along as well. But the uh, I think it's a great pairing. I mean, I oh, I, I don't it. know of any I don't know of any other band that could tour. I mean, we've toured with with Yes, with Def Leppard, you know, with Boston. Uh, with Bad Company, and now it's going to be Joan Jett. I mean, that's a really 
wide array of uh, of genres of, of mm-hmm. classic music, and 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 yet we're able to play with all those bands and, and really do well with all the audiences that they bring in. You know, I saw Tesla out in um, Los Angeles. On the, they played a show out there on the campus of the UCLA College, and it was yeah. a miserable, rainy, like raw, rainy kind of nasty evening. They, oh, yeah. These guys came out there, and they were probably one of the top five live bands I've ever seen. They're, yeah, they're so they're tight. Strong. They're so tight. Yeah, they're a very strong band. Yeah, in, in every in every way, and they have this really devoted devoted following. Yeah. So we 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 know that those those people are going to be in attendance, and uh, as well as you know all the the young oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the devotees. And, uh, and and the six faithful. So I yes. think it's going to be a really, I think it's going to be a great blending of, of audience and and of uh, a great night of classic rock that'll probably push beyond four hours. Oh man, there's so I many. You, th- you combine sticks, Joan Jett, and Tesla. Yeah, there's a couple songs people might remember on that on that little lineup there. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some short throws at the end of the night. Yeah, for sure. I want I want to talk back uh, back uh, on the album the mission um, a little bit more. Um, yeah. The the song Radio Silence is the one that's the song that really grabbed me. Um, I mean, of course, all I like every song on the record, but Radio Silence was the one that that uh, that I love the most. That's my favorite because I love that, that 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 great harmonizing and the background vocals and those melodies. And like I was talking about before, it just threw me back to that to the seventies, man. Um, yeah. Where where do you think? I guess why? Why? And, and again, I don't. I don't like to knock music because the current music. There's a lot of great stuff out there, but I don't hear those melodies like I heard in this song, "Radio Silence." You don't hear it as much. What's going on with that? I think that the. Uh, well, first of all, there, I, I'm glad you pointed out there, there is some great new music that's out there, and I find it. You know, week after week, I find new things that I think are just. It's fantastic and, and equal to anything, but the, to to really champion to some degree the the, the classic rock era, the, the notion of having the, the the big chorus that everybody chimes in on was really a, a centerpiece to a lot of a lot of the writing, not all of it, but a lot of the writing of that era. And Radio Silence, I think, falls squarely into that category. Uh, as you point out, and that's probably why it was one of the first ones that got its, its hooks into you, because mm-hmm. I guess that's what they call them. They call them hooks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, when we were working on that song, it, it was it, it was really a, a way of going. Okay, how does how does it go from one catchy section to the next catchy section to the, you know, and never let the listener down. That's a lot of the a lot of the. Uh, and also make quick and and kind of unexpected changes in the in this the, the sonic palette of the song. You know, suddenly it goes from being a very quiet and introspective thing mm-hmm. to this exploding, you know, big larger than life chorus. And right. I mean that fits with the whole theme of the record anyway. But that really is part of the part of the paradigm of of, of writing a great classic rock song. And I think. I think that's probably why Radio Silence hit you first, and then the others would uh, would begin to follow suit as you get deeper and deeper into the, uh, the album. I have that, that's one of I have I have three favorites on that record. I liked all of them, but three of the ones that that grabbed me the most was the one we just spoke about, uh, Radio Silence, but also Overture. Now Overture, Overture, of course, the keys. Um, yeah, it's it's a minute and twenty seconds long. I wish it was like, I wish it was an hour and twenty seconds what tech seconds long. I thought it was amazing. It's just like this journey you go through in a minute and twenty seconds. It's like blew me away. I mean I touch on that song a little bit. Yeah, this is a, that that's a piece I have to give full credit to Tommy Shaw for writing that. He brought it in in its kind of its infancy stage. He played it for me on the bus actually one day just <laughs> off his phone but you know, is this something, is this too grandiose, et cetera? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. I think it should be even, it should be even, it's even more pompous. Right. And that's basically how we approached it. And of course, we weave a couple, a couple of the main themes, musical motifs that, that arise throughout the record are in, are in the overture piece as they, as they should be. And uh, we, that's basically been, for the last year, that's been our walk-on music, so to speak. The Overture plays, and we nice. come on stage and break into Gone, Gone, Gone. 
which is which is the third song my, my, of my top three. What a great segue! Oh, fantastic. Yeah, um, the song first of all grabs you by the ears and rocks you. I mean, it's a really it, the song just really it's it, it's it, it's uh, one of those songs that can get you a speeding ticket if you're not careful if you're driving and listening to it right. on the radio. Right. It has yeah. it all again. Yeah. It goes like, again. I, I, I touch on it again. The vocals, the keys, that that guitar riffs. Uh, just touch on that song a little bit more. Sure. So there, there are great elements of, of sticks that, that came to came to the surface and gone, gone, gone. Again, that's a, that's a very short piece. You need to do a lot of things only two and a half minutes. Right. JY was playing that, that opening riff. That, you know, that opening riff. Yeah, song. yeah. He was, he was using that more or less as a warm-up uh, for about two years. And he'd be, you know, he'd pick up his guitar and we all do a pretty extensive warm up in the dressing room before any show. And he'd pick up his guitar and he just kept playing that riff. And a few months later, I hear Tommy, Tommy suddenly picking up his guitar and playing that riff along with JY. And then when they began to kind of work it together and harmonize it a bit, I, 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 I basically said, are we, are we going to make that into a song or is it just going to be this backstage <laughs> thing that we all are really digging? And, and yeah. so Tommy then took it with our producer, Willie Vankovich, and it, it turned it into that song, Gone, Gone, Gone. And then they felt that it needed a real, um, you know, a real kind of belted out vocal approach. And so they, that's, how, that's how it felt into my hands to, to, uh, or into my into my singing <laughs> manner to uh, to deliver the song. So I was really pleased with that, but I I, I think it, it really, the genesis of that song is that J.Y. riff. Yeah, it's, it's great. It's Again, I, everybody listening to this, go get this record. Um, it, it's just got it all from A to Z. Um, you know, there's so many there's so many songs that Sticks put out over the years that that's like literally impact people's lives. I mean, people don't. Some people don't realize the impact music can have on people. Um, it's therapeutical. It's universal. There's so much things yeah. about music. Of all the of all the songs you sing with the band, what's what's your favorite song to sing live to the audience? That's a that's a great question because it's it's uh, unfortunately I can't give you one answer because it's a moving target. Sure, you know, that's I, true. It, it it depends so much on the night. I, there's there's nothing that I that I think that I don't really enjoy singing. So I start with that. I think that overall, though, with my my experience in the band, and that's been you know, I'm in my twentieth year now with, with with the group around the world. By the time we get to playing Renegade, which is usually the last song of the night, not always, but usually is. I've seen the audience, uh, it's because that's a Tommy Shaw song that he sings lead on, I, we, we just harmonize mm -hmm. the opening and the middle section. I really get to kind of take in the night and take in what the audience, uh, you know, what the, the uh, trajectory that they've gone through over the, over the night from starting off uh, to, to finish where I see, you know, there's a sea of a few thousand faces with big smiles on them. And it really kind of sums up the... Um, the feeling of the whole night and when what it's uh, how it's affected people. Mm. So I guess if I had to pick one, it's 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 that song. But for the reason that that, that I just outlined, it's it's like it's the cherry on top at the end of us building this this great mountain of uh, mm. classic rock. Do you do you feed off that energy like when you're singing a song like Lady or or again? Oh, entirely, uh, I mean, entirely. I, I, yeah. I mean, we play so many shows a year, Brad. I mean, we play never less than 100 shows a year. Wow. There are nights just because of the circumstances where, you know, there, there might be, of, of all of that, maybe, maybe about 10 shows a year where, so one-tenth, where I'm suiting up in the dressing room and I'm feeling like, I, I don't know if I got it tonight. I don't know if, I, you know, I don't know if... You're right. This is, you know, my my shoulder hurts or you yeah. know something happened in the day that you know at home that you're, you're kind of concerned with etc we get out there and about the third or fourth song in look out at the audience and go oh my god what was I thinking like 15 wow. minutes ago yeah, <laughs> yeah. like this is now the center of the universe and this audience has, has kind of pulled us into this great uh, adventure that why would you not 
not want to be part of this, you know, and suddenly all, all any any little things that you're concerned with or any aches and pains or whatever <laughs> it happens to be, those those are long forgotten and you're completely absorbed in the moment of uh, of, uh, of what's happening. And that I, that is part of what music does to people. If you're really engaged with it, that is that is a, a, that is the biggest part probably of, of how it um, how it can alter your state yeah. in, in a very short time. Isn't that amazing how it can be therapeutical both ways? Because people, when they want to go see a stick show or or, uh, or any show of their favorite band, yeah. they want to go because yeah. there's so much negativity in the world with politics and yeah. and all that crap all, yeah. all across the world. So when people go to, to go see a show, they, they, that's their, their medicine. And you just gave an example of how the people that went to your show was your medicine for that one-tenth of the time when you're you know being a human yeah. being and not feeling it so much. It absolutely works both ways. It absolutely is a is a it's a combined mm -hmm. and a united experience that, that that happens. And we are we just happen to be a group of people who are who are aware of that and open to it. I mean, this is uh, it's funny. I, I I make this comment often when I when I meet people that I've either that I went to school with or that I knew many years ago. I can instantly tell the ones with whom music is still a vital force in their life and the ones who have kind of let it go by the wayside and, and uh, you know, have, I can tell them right away because they've kind of shriveled. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's not, a good, that's not a good word, you know? Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> and they've, they've lost whatever... Uh, the, the, the thing that, that really helps you to engage with life, I, I, could, I feel like, a, like an evangelist for, for what music does to people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you've, you, you, you've pointed that out. It's become more and more important to us now, perhaps more than ever. Right. You know, and it's not, it's not simply, that although, it, although a little bit can be, uh, can be attributed to nostalgia in some ways, it's far deeper than that. It's far more the, the, the soundtrack of your life and how it inspires you is, is what's being doled out. And, and it really, it's not too lofty a, a statement to say that it really does have a profound, you know, a, a manner of, of changing people's uh, uh, mental outlook on just about everything. Yeah, man, very well said. And you mentioned before, 20 years now you've been doing your thing with sticks and I know this is going to be a hard question because you've had so many experiences so I was going to ask you what's the most like most memorable experience but maybe I'll make it a little more ambiguous and say can you share with us a very very momentous experience you've had over the last 20 years like one that kind of sticks out well you know there are uh, as you just mentioned there are so many um, uh, oh. Easy, easy ones to relate to, I guess, would be you know we 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 played twice at the Super Bowl since the time I've been in the band, and, oh, wow. and I remember I remember the second time we played there <laughs> it was in San Diego. But the second one we did uh, just being at the, the vortex in the center of that bowl of you know seventy five thousand wow. people or whatever was in the stands, and knowing that uh, how many eyes are on you, and they used. In that show, they used it particularly because there's a you know a lot of uh, all kinds of great uh, choreography going on on the field around us. Uh, but they used this great blast of uh, pyrotechnics that came up behind us mm. uh, like halfway through one of the songs. And I remember, <laughs> you know, I remember the heat blast <laughs> that they kind of hit us. And how <clears throat> it was funny how. They warned everyone else, you know, get get as far away from that when it happens. And we all knew exactly what was going to happen. Get get away from it. They warned everyone else, but basically, not us. They figured, oh no, they're <laughs> they're completely fireproof. Oh Bullet my god! They'll be they'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got to scare the heck out of you. We came off kind of. It was it was really exhilarating because of of all of the you know the Super Bowl. Uh, uh, majestic uh, event that it is, coupled with the fact that wow, they really they really thought we could take the heat, and it turned out that we could. <laughs> That's amazing, man. <laughs> so uh, anyway, a, a lucky thing, but. Uh, that was that, that's one such moment that just popped into my head. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's <laughs> I, a great I can, story. I can list many others. 
Yeah, I'm sure you can. <laughs> that, that'll be the book release maybe one day. You can you can put that in a in a book because I'm sure you got plenty of chapters to write. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, um, and again, you touched on how many shows a year and, and um, venues you go to. Is there is there like a um, is there a venue that you really, really, really enjoy more than others? Maybe do you have a favorite venue? Uh, you know, I always think that I do. Whenever I look at the uh, itinerary every year, you know, for example, I love playing uh, on a night uh, when the when the weather is cooperating, or maybe not. Uh, there's a, a great venue in New York uh, known as Jones Beach. Oh, that's of course. Big, that's, that's the yeah, the big amphitheater that's there right mm -hmm. right, right on the water. And there's a, it's pretty magical. We can see the, the um, you know, the, the uh, skyline of New York, and yeah. and, the, and you're looking out to the water, and looking out to the Atlantic, and just the, it's a pretty beautiful location. But having said that, it's much like asking about what the favorite song is. Mm -hmm. Often there are surprise venues in any given year that wind up becoming your favorite just because oh. of how the people were on that specific night and how mm -hmm. and how the vibe kind of went down to where you're like, you know, two years ago, there was a venue we played. It was, it was just, it was like a summer fair in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. And they expected about 10,000 people and about 40,000 showed up. Oh, wow. So you know, uh, this, this big spill of people going in all directions because you know how those county fairs are the big grandstand yeah. but then the surrounding areas and you couldn't look anywhere down the midway or anywhere that, that people hadn't you know were, were closing in on the stage basically just crushing in um, I don't mean that in a dangerous way I just mean there was just right. a lot of humanity and sure. they all were looking the, the vibe that was coming off that audience and the way the sun was setting Wow. And I'm, 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 it's kind of a poetic thing. It suddenly we came off, and I said, we, we all, every one of us said, that was, that was my favorite show of the year so far. And it's like we weren't expecting wow. that to be, but it became a magical place. And so much of that, of course, is because of, because of the people, because of the weather, because of the, yeah. the music, the, the date, whatever it was, it all kind of culminated in making it a really special venue on that night. Um, and that happens every year. There's something that just, in, in one place or another that you weren't expecting, it becomes a favorite venue. So it's, it's easy for me to say, no, we played Wembley in London, England a couple of times. That's my favorite venue because it's Wembley, you know, or, or we played, you know, in, uh, in Los Angeles, we played the Greek Theater, which is such a such a uh, legendary oh, place. Yeah. So that's my favorite. So these are easy ones to pick because they're 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 such uh, known and legendary places. But there's there's always one or two that you weren't expecting, and that's the that's the beauty of this life is that it's the unexpected that that, that so often makes it so worth, worthwhile. Wow! Shout out to Des Moines, Iowa, man. Nice way to rep, man. I know. That's you awesome. Say. <laughs> Yeah. That's great, man. Now, yeah. um, Gowan, 33 years ago, am I right on that? Strange Animal release, was that 33 years ago? You are. That's 33 years ago this year. Yes, oh, that's man. kind of shocking for me to even say those words, but yes. Um, so for people that are, people in the United States never got exposed to that album because it wasn't released right. down here, I think. I think about a thousand copies came out as promotional pieces that wound up. Uh, so people here, so there are some people here who will mention it, but in Canada it was a triple platinum record. It was a number one album. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it's a turning point in my career when Strange Animal came out. Mm -hmm. And the, the last song on that record is a song called The Criminal Mind. And that was, uh, that was a gold single and a number one song in Canada. And it's a song that Sticks became aware of when I played a show with them yeah. in, in the 90s and so we wound up play, making doing our own six version of that song we played every year uh, at a number of shows we've got it on a couple of live dvds etc so that record was pivotal, pivotal in my life on a couple of occasions you know it's funny how things happen because i'm guessing now i might be wrong but i'm guessing you would <laughs> like to have you would have liked to have gallon music distributed in, in into the american households but you never know what could have happened, and maybe, maybe because it didn't, you know, Sticks found you, um, and and your Sticks journey happened. So you never know what could have happened. I, you know, I've had that same 
fought myself. It was it was a frustration to me sure. with all the records that I put out. There were six studio albums in total, and I was right at the point of making my greatest hits record in Canada wow. when I first met up with Sticks. But I haven't had that thought. I, I, it, it has occurred to me that that, um, that had those had those records made it through into the, into the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, people would have had. Uh, they would have already had certain uh, uh, opinions or, or yeah. um, yeah, had me in a certain category and may not have been as open to the notion of, of this foreigner guy coming into, coming into sticks and, uh, and being part of the band. I don't know. That was the reaction in some parts of Canada. I can, I can tell you now that initially it, it, it was odd to some to some areas of the country that, that suddenly I, I'm in sticks. That's well, but he's a solo guy, you know. It was, yeah. But I've done everything. I've done everything backwards in my career. You know, I had a solo <laughs> career, then I joined a band. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a pretty good backwards plan. I think it's working out pretty good. For it, you. Yeah, it's, it's a plan that had nothing to do with me. Everything to do with it. <laughs> the gods of rock decided. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Lawrence, I've had you for 30 minutes, man. I really, really, really appreciate you doing this interview. Um, before I let you go, um, is there anything you want to talk about as far as where where, where the fans can get your the, the new record and maybe social? I'm not well, sure, sure if you're on social yeah, media. Yeah, I mean, so. obviously, all the social media outlets are, are the easiest way to, to connect to anything that we're doing tour-wise or to find where to buy the mission or where to get the mission either on a download or if you want to get a CD or if you want to get the vinyl record. I just go to, go to sticksworld.com. That's the that's our major website, and or just as a big Facebook page, it's got a couple of million people on there. Nice. You can go through there. There are all kinds of ways that you can that you can suddenly connect through or you know go to Spotify, go to any of the any of the any of the music outlets, you know, Apple, iTunes, and uh, and you'll be able to, to find all points of connection that uh, that will bring you into our um, into our circle. Well, there it is, folks. I told you I was going to get them, and I got them. I really appreciate you doing this. Everybody go to sticksworld.com, pick up the mission. It's a fantastic record. Thank you so much for doing this. Great to talk to you, Brad. Thanks so much, and thanks for knowing so much about the new album. It's, it's, that, that's of vital importance right now. It's just a pleasure to speak with you. I feel the same way, man. Appreciate you. Hi, everybody. My name is Katrina Gray, and you're listening to the Brett Cooney's Podcast Show. And that's the place where you can listen to all the cool podcasts. Enjoy! <laughs>